And, you know, many times people rely on the people from their past for advice and support because they feel as though they can trust them. It's loyalty, right? They're your ride or die friend. They hold your secrets and maybe they have supported you in other times in your life. And so you feel like that these are the people that you should turn to. And you know, I have friends like that too. When I look back over different times in my life, there are certain friendships that mean so much to me because of how close we were then. And over my lifetime, I've had friends from my neighborhood, friends from school and friends that I met, you know, just in life. I even made a few friends at work from time to time. But as I got older, no matter how close we once were, being a friend at some point, you're not friends in the same way anymore. Because there is a difference in confiding in someone you trust and venting. Having a confidant is important. While my husband is my greatest confidant, right? I don't share everything with him and nor does he want me to. There are some matters in my life that I don't share with him because I value and protect his vision of me as his partner, as his lover, and as his friend. I never want to appear to him as a relative or a homie, right? So to remain sexy, to remain mysterious and alluring, I must find other outlets to share some conversations. So every conversation isn't for every confidant or to determine if you are just out of bounds, that you've just immersed yourself in this people-pleasing sphere. Many of your days are stressful and draining. How could they not? But ask yourself, what are some of the ways that people-pleasing shows up for you? But in my journey, I've seen firsthand how the desire for approval can ensnare you it can entangle you into doing things that are really not what you're supposed to be doing. Like you, I felt the weight of expectations, the silent pressure to conform and to please. But here's the truth. In seeking to please everyone, you risk losing yourself. And then you'll no longer feel inadequate about certain areas in your life because that's the only reason why we complain and vent to other people. We have not placed ourselves as our future self and started taking action to make changes in our life. So we are inadequate. We're inadequate. But that's only in your control. It's not in anyone else's control. Because if you use self-worth to work on yourself, for yourself, and not just to prove your worthiness to other people, then you are on the right track of getting out of struggle mode and getting into prosperity mode, prosperity in every area of your life, in your relationships, in life fulfillment. At you some know, point, you're not friends in the same way anymore. We stop talking to or seeing each other every day or as frequently as we used to. And maybe we got busy or our interests just changed, or maybe there was an incident that just changed the tag, like, okay, how can we move past this? If Do I want to move past this? You know, but what I once had with that person isn't there anymore. And I heard, I know you've heard this saying, people are in your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. Some relationships were not meant to last for your entire lifetime you have to assess the value or influence of the relationships you have in your life today. Because those relationships and those interactions have gotten you to the point where you are right now. So if you wanna progress forward, then you have to recognize how these relationships, how these relationships influence the dynamics of your future. Loyalty in this instance is not what matters. Let me explain this. So everybody is caught up when they talk about what a true friend is or what they want in a relationship. The first thing I hear is loyalty. Loyalty. I don't weigh loyalty the same way 
at this point in my life when it comes to friendships. You know, the way I see most people defining this characteristic of loyalty and, and they apply it to friendship is that they expect a good and grown person with their own family and their own responsibilities to somehow be obligated to place the importance of my well-being or their own well-being above their own. Who does? There's a great venting pitfall. You got to forget about only trusting friends from your past, right? You need to start developing your circle carefully. That doesn't mean you don't associate with people of the past, but there's no need for you to go vent to them when they're not going to understand what you're going through, nor are they going to have a solution. Venting to just anybody is a no-go. You want to share with people who uplift and support not people who add fuel to the fire, people who give you bad advice, right? You're in a crisis and you really need to vent to someone, okay? So you pick up the phone and you call your trusty, true confidant. So for me, that's my sister. I know that I can share some situations with her and she will keep it and she'll keep that information just between the two of us, right? But in your hypothetical situation, your true confidant doesn't answer. But you know, your one friend know, the one who knows everybody's business and is a that person is available, right? And you call because you just have to vent to somebody. You just have to get it off your chest. You can't hold it in any longer or you think you're going to pop. And as soon as you start sharing your story with that person, you know deep down in your gut that that was a bad idea. People pleasing is a behavior. One psychological principle of people pleasing is the fear of rejection, where individuals engage in pleasing behaviors to avoid criticism or disapproval of others. When you have not identified or you haven't started to manage some of your triggers, you will continue to people please until you address the trigger that's causing this from your past. Here's what I can tell you to do. If these words resonate with you, I invite you to explore deeper with my book, Brains and Bobbles Do What Works For You. It's a guide to navigating life's complexity with grace and strength. You know, this is your companion for curating the life that you want, a life of elegance and empowerment. The trigger from my past that makes me go far beyond what's necessary to show accountability or to show my capability or my ability to love is has to do with people assuming that I'm lazy. And, you know, in all transparency growing up, I did keep a messy room, but it was messy, not dirty mostly clothes and books and things like that. I wasn't lazy. My parents were business owners and they worked six or seven days a week. So my mom would hire someone to clean and organize our home. So with that being done, I wasn't like some of my friends or like some of the people that I know. I didn't have to do the same chores every weekend and make sure that my room was a certain way and wash clothes. And I mean, I'm not saying I ever did those things, but it wasn't a requirement for me. So when I got around people, my friends, and, and you know, when I became an adult and I would see how people operated in a certain way, it would make me feel like, did I miss out on something? You know, am I less than adequate? Am I not equipped? You know, I have been inadequate or felt inadequate in some areas in my life because I used to share thoughts and plans about the things I wanted to do with people. But what I found is you must not share your plans with everyone, even if you're close to them, because sharing your plans in the planning phase can destroy your motivation and your passion. You must be stealthy. 
I like that word. You must operate below the radar. It's nobody's business. You don't even have to hint at what you're doing. Burning the candle at both ends, burning the midnight oil, whatever you want to call it. If you call it hustling, that's you. I prefer not to. I call it working out my plan for my future self. And I can do that in quiet. And I'm not talking about being sneaky or deceptive in any way. What I'm saying is that it's all right for you to have some areas in your life that are private. You don't owe anyone a discussion about all the aspects of your life. And you don't want everyone, you don't want everyone's input and you don't want to know all of theirs. I'm telling you, you don't, because you don't want that weight of their opinion or their struggle to become your deal. So, you know, I've shared plans that I've considered for a long time. You know, I've thought about things over and over and then I've already made a plan to do something about it. And then I mentioned it to someone, people who I thought would support my ideas. And I've been shockingly disappointed more than one time about their responses. You know, why are you doing that? That's not going to work. Oh, I've heard that. That's not going to work. So-and-so tried it and it was a waste of time. Or they share their philosophies that don't align with your beliefs because they're false, right? And those ways of thinking, they share them with you. And why are you listening to them when they don't align with what you're thinking about? Who does that? Real life doesn't work that way. Loyalty in the sense that most people are talking about, like I just described, is an attribute that you'd give to someone in a gangster movie or in an espionage, espionage film. They aren't real life, okay? What you need are people who are either new friends or old friends around you that support you and encourage you to do better. You need a community of people that are planning and moving forward in their own lives and in their careers and even in their relationships and they're working on their emotions. They are working on themselves to be better for themselves. You also need friends who support you when you succeed and those same friends can encourage you when you have moments of failure. There's nothing wrong with maintaining relationships from your past. I keep in touch with friends that I've known all my life. I don't necessarily ask them for advice on things or I definitely don't gossip with them under the guise of catching up. And I don't vent to them because no matter their success in life, if our interactions only serve to remind me of a time when I, you know, that I've emotionally moved past or where I've gotten over some things, or they consistently remind me of the me that I used to be, then I have to see them when I see them. They are not the people that I'm gonna go to on a regular basis. I just don't have room for conversations that don't align with the me that I am now and the future that I'm creating for myself. And they say they won't tell anybody, and they, but <laughs> they say they won't tell anybody, right? but they told you things you shouldn't know about them or other people, but you just had to vent to them. Venting to this person has not helped your issue and it has not helped your emotions. Not only are they likely to spread your business to people who have absolutely no reason to notice information, they can't even offer you good advice. They offer you other people related stories You're like, yeah, I know so-and-so she went through the same thing, but you know, they ended up getting a divorce or they'll tell you what they would do or what they wouldn't do. Couldn't be me. Wouldn't be me. Or they bring up other negative talk that further damages your emotions. Yeah. He was probably with her all along. Girl, you know, men ain't no good. Or you got to work so hard to even do that. How you going to do that? This is why protecting your environment with boundaries is so important. Your emotions impact your thinking. Your thinking impacts your behavior and your behavior 
sets up your environment. So you have to be very selective as to who you share the important and private aspects of your life with. Because you don't owe anyone your business, especially out of loyalty, or you think you are not being a good friend if you don't share this thing that's going on in your life. You know what? Bump that. Bump that. Your first priority is to protect your emotions. And that's what you do when you set up a boundary with yourself not to vent. So then it had me to do things over and above to make up where what I thought was a shortcoming and also what I thought everyone was scrutinizing me for. But here is my sophisticated empowerment principle. And this helps me recognize when I have a triggered response. And I encourage you to write this down so that you can use this as well. I've said this before, but I'll keep saying it until it gets into you. And I say this to myself. My emotions impact my thinking. My thinking impacts my behavior. And my behavior impacts my environment. Once I've identified that my environment of stress and chaos is constructed by my behavior, then I'm able to work on a plan to change my environment by changing my behavior. See, it all works together. I say no to the activities that don't work for me. That's the title of my book. It's in the title. Do what works for you, right? I say no to activities that cause me stress or cost time or just are unnecessary. But I determine these conditions. No one else does it for me. They might say something like school is not for everybody. Or you're a helicopter mom. You need to give your daughter more space. Give her more freedom so she can express herself. Or I wouldn't be checking in with my man, I'm grown. You know, most times we assume that the people in our lives that we love are more like us than they are. We assume because we've known them all of our lives or they've known us for such a significant amount of time that they understand us, but that doesn't mean that they understand they don't, that doesn't mean that they're on the same emotional journey that you're on. And let me tell you this, they might not be prepared for the person that you're going to become. That's why you have to do it under the radar because you don't need those influences telling you what you should desire. My book is called Do What Works For You, not Do What Works For The Peanut Gallery, <laughs> right? So avoid getting set back or avoid staying stuck by working under the radar. You don't need other people's bad advice. You don't need other people's, you know, myths crowding your dreams and your desires for what would make your life happy. So get out of making the noise about being busy for myself. Leave some relationships and I don't know, you know, what may have happened between us in those relationships. Those are ones that I just don't have time for anymore. I'm not trying to fix them or trying to make it work. And then there are other relationships that I've just had to place in a different category. As we get older, you know, we don't, th we shouldn't throw around the term friend as often as we do. Because friends are those ones that are your confidants, the ones that I was just talking about that support you when you're doing well, and they encourage you when you're not doing well. So some people are not in the friend category. They might be in the acquaintance category or somebody that I know category. And I mean, maybe some other time I'll give definitions to those categories. But what I'm saying is friends are the ones who are there when you need them. They are part of that community that you rely on. So the category of a past friend that I may have fond memories of, you know, are, is different. They no longer fit in my life the same way, but it's okay because I've purged the relationships. So I give energy, I give time, I give momentum to those relationships that are going to go with me in the future. 
but you also have to make a commitment to yourself to do everything possible to manage these adverse emotions that may come from your past or that are triggered by something in your life. You have to address it. It is up to you to find a solution to how to manage this emotion. And it is possible. So don't think that you're just going to rest in your default emotion because when you are becoming sophisticated and empowered, you don't just let things happen to you. You take control of your life. Part of that control is that you might need to seek professional insight. Sometimes it takes a pro to untangle all of the knots and, and help you through all of the valleys that you're going through in life. So don't shy away from seeking a therapist or a counselor when things get really heavy for you. You have to create a community for yourself that is supportive. And, you know, think outside the box. Again, the people that you've grown up with or the people that you have been around and even some of your relatives are not the people that you need to be accountable to or that you need to confide in. I found an accountability partner that I share ideas or challenges that I have um, through my business. I found a partner online. Now we started out as business accountability partners, but we're friends now and we have never met face to face. We don't even FaceTime. We've been face to face doing things in business, but we speak on the phone multiple times a week. What this relationship has done is it's provided me with an outlet to share this part of my life with someone who can relate and someone who could have appropriate and applicable advice, not just someone who is just lending an ear for the sake of just letting me get it off my chest. And I'm not concerned about her telling my business to everyone I know. And you can do this. You can find a group and that group can be in person or online, but you need to find someone that you can share and have confidence in and confide in. You have to do that for yourself. Before me. This process first starts by contemplation and practicing self-awareness. This is where the big questions come in. So in the article, Keeping Up the Big Questions by Jaweed uh, Kaleem for the Huffington Post, Kaleem asks big questions like, how can we live a good life? And what is the meaning of life? These questions are like road signs that they, they help us to understand why people pleasing is a problem. They are big arching questions, but they if we drill down, we'll find out why we are people pleasing and how that relates to those questions about what life is truly about. Because if you're people people pleasing, you're always trying to make others happy, but you forget about yourself. That's what people pleasing does. It prioritizes everyone else perceived wants and needs before your own. And you're the one that's perceiving that. It's like trying to find the meaning of life by constantly doing things for other people and not thinking about what makes you happy. But here's the thing. The answers to these big questions are personal. They're about finding your own purpose and your own happiness. So if you're stuck in the people-pleasing trap, you miss out on discovering what really matters to you. In a nutshell, those big questions in the article show us that it's important to recognize when we're trapped in people pleasing because it alters us in such a detrimental way. People pleasing is like taking a detour from our own journey to finding meaning and happiness to do all these other activities that don't help us get where we want to go. Leave that alone. First Thessalonians 4 11 says, and that ye study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we command you. This scripture encourages us to focus on our tasks, work diligently and live a quiet life, applying a sense of privacy and reliance. Reliance because you're not venting and sharing with everyone else. So you have the opportunity to build your own strength, your own knowledge, and you can look back and know that you have done something for yourself. Any journey 
to a future of emotional, relational, or financial success takes time. Yeah, you could hit a lick or fall in love or manage your emotions in a new way. All of this. And when I say hit a lick, I mean, you really find an opportunity to make real money, not anything criminal. All of this takes time. And delayed gratification is a concept that I test and apply all the time. So don't rush the plans you have for your future. If you properly plan your future using the bling concept, then time is just the time. It takes as long as it takes, you know, however long it takes. Your emotional management allows you to have patience and allows patience to really work in your life. You're not rushing to get the accolades that most people do who want to have some type of fame or recognition. You're not fighting to be seen or you're not even fighting to get money. It's for life fulfillment and satisfaction why you do things. And that's why you should do things. By practicing delayed gratification, you're curating the life that you desire. You're collecting the things. You're setting it up. You're putting it together. You're designing. You're creating. You know, you are creating a lifestyle, not just a situation. If you plan quietly and execute and delay the need to show everyone what you're doing prematurely, then you're going to be all right. You're going to be on the track, on the road to where it is you want to be in your future. You don't need to get the buy-in. Don't become inadequate or remain inadequate. Build yourself up, no matter what it takes. If it takes looking at YouTube videos for three weeks to get the information that you need so that you can do things on your own, get the information, do it. You don't need to get everyone's advice about it. I've said before, you can't let the buddy system be your way of doing things for your life, okay? Forget the buddy system. You need to take control of your life. 